Hello, everybody. I would like to welcome you to uh, our 13th module of uh, the telecourse on uh, the way of the psychonaut. And today we will focus on a very, very important subject, uh, synchronicity, something that was introduced into psychiatry and psychology by uh, Carl Gustav Jung. Um, I have a very special surprise for you, my dear and close friend, uh, Rick Tarnas will be with us. We have known each other for over uh, 40 years uh, when we met at Esalen and then started working together and uh, have cooperated on uh, um, research that correlated uh, various episodes uh, involving uh, holotropic states of consciousness and uh, archetypal uh, astrology. And then uh, later, uh, we both uh, have been teaching at the CIS, um, where, where Rick started a um, uh, special department of uh, philosophy, cosmology, and, and uh, consciousness. And we have taught together uh, courses uh, combining uh, research, uh, the holotropic states, and archetypal uh, astrology. Uh, Rick also uh, taught a special course on synchronicity. So uh, I will ask him to complement whatever I will have to say on synchronicity, and then we'll uh, spend the rest of the session uh, talking about the importance of uh, uh, archetypal astrology for uh, um, consciousness research and also many, many other, other uh, discipline. So it's a real, real great pleasure to have him as, as our guest. So many of us had experiences where the very predictable, logical fabric of reality uh, seems to uh, fall apart and uh, we experience extraordinary uh, coincidences. Uh, and when people work with holotropic states of consciousness, the incidence of these kinds of uh, episodes can be so frequent that it starts challenging their very concept of uh, reality. And uh, they might experience strong uh, feelings, uh, fear of, of uh, insanity. So this is, a, this is a phenomenon that's extremely important for uh, people who work with um, holotropic states of consciousness, whether it's some rigorous spiritual practice, um, psychedelic sessions, uh, work with some powerful forms of uh, experiential psychotherapy, uh, like uh, reversing or the holotropic uh, breathwork, or participate in some uh, shamanic rituals. And it's also you know, very, very important phenomenon for people who have spontaneous episodes of uh, uh, holotropic states of consciousness that uh, my late wife, Christina, and I call uh, spiritual uh, emergencies or, or transpersonal uh, crisis. So uh, this is a phenomenon that uh, was brought to the attention of professional circles by uh, Carl Gustav Jung who added another dimension to just a series of uh, coincidences in uh, the material world. Uh, when he coined the term synchronicity, it described a very, very extraordinary situation where one pole of the coincidence was actually intrapsychic uh, phenomenon, like a, like a dream or, or a vision. And then the other pole was um, uh, something that was happening in material reality. So that it seemed that uh, uh, our psyche can enter into a, a playful interaction with what we consider to be objective material world. And this is of course a major challenge uh, for uh, materialistic science because the, the basic idea is that there is a material world out there and we just reflect it uh, primarily through the uh, functions of, of our sensory uh, sensory organs. So um, 
Jung was very, very aware of the fact that this is challenging the, the very cornerstone of materialistic science, the principle of uh, linear causality. Everything that happens has a cause and also uh, an effect. And suddenly there were phenomena for which there was not uh, interpretation uh, in terms of horizontal uh, linear uh, uh, causality. So he uh, hesitated about 20 years until he accumulated enormous number of these observations that he could make a, a really um, uh, convincing case for, uh, for this phenomenon. So um, he presented this uh, first uh, in 1951 in the last uh, Eranos uh, conference uh, under the name uh, Synchronicity and a Causal Connecting uh, Principle. Uh, the Eranos meetings were uh, amazing uh, yearly uh, meetings in, in uh, Ascona by uh, Lago Maggiore. Uh, this was something that was initiated by Jung and brought every year uh, really the, the cream of uh, the intelligentsia, uh, basically world, worldwide intelligentsia. There were people like uh, Joseph Campbell, Heinrich uh, Zimmer, the, Mircea Eliad, uh, Daisetz uh, Suzuki, uh, uh, um, Otto uh, uh, um, Paul, uh, Paul Otto or Otto, uh, Otto Paul, uh, uh, Paul Tillich and, and uh, many others. Uh, this then was published as, a, as an essay. Uh, Jung begins this uh, essay by uh, telling a story of uh, an Austrian uh, biologist, uh, Paul Kammerer, who was described in uh, uh, the book by Arthur Köstler called The Case of the Midwife uh, Toad. It's a very, very tragic story. It's, it's a Lamarckian, he presented a challenge to, to um, people who were um, Darwinians and was uh, finally driven to, to suicide. Now, uh, from there, uh, he goes to a story which was published by uh, the French astronomer uh, Flammarion. And it was a story of uh, a man who uh, got a, um, very, very special kind of plum pudding uh, for his birthday and uh, liked it very much. But for the next 10 years, he had no uh, opportunity to again taste this, uh, this uh, plum pudding until he saw it on the menu in a Paris restaurant. And he called the waiter, ordered the, the dessert and the waiter came back with an apology was pointing to a man in uh, one of the tables and says, sorry, you know, the last order uh, just went to the gentleman over there. And uh, this man, then uh, Emile Deschamps, French writer, looked in the direction and there was his, uh, his friend, Fongeby, who was uh, gobbling up the last uh, serving of this dessert. And then for, for many years again, there was no uh, encounter with this pudding until uh, this, um, Monsieur Fongeby was uh, invited to a party where they happened to be serving this special uh, plum pudding. Uh, and as he was eating it, he thought, well, the, the last thing that's uh, missing here is uh, Monsieur Fongeby, who was there for the first two encounters uh, with uh, this uh, pudding. And then uh, the bell rang and a very confused man uh, came in and it was Monsieur Fongeby who arrived to this third uh, encounter with the pudding, uh, um, but he had a wrong address. He, he was intending to go to another place. So this is a very unusual constellation of uh, events that, you know, even have a certain 
sense of humor that many of these uh, serial uh, coincidences have. Certainly something that uh, would be easier to attribute to a whimsical creator than just to, you know, statistically uh, plausible uh, event in the, in the material uh, world. Now, Jung was very much aware of the fact that this was a challenge uh, to uh, the whole materialistic worldview. And he started looking with great hope to the development of uh, quantum relativistic physics and actually uh, developed a friendship with his uh, patient, uh, with Wolfgang Pauli, one of the main figures in uh, the development of quantum relativistic physics. Uh, he's a very interesting man who actually was also living with, uh, with uh, synchronicity or what he believed was a synchronistic event. Uh, which was that wherever he was in a building, none of the devices uh, were working. And uh, uh, George Gamow, the astronomer, uh, called it the uh, Pauli effect. Uh, or it was also called the, the second exclusion uh, principle uh, by Pauli. It was, one was the exclusion principle was very serious uh, contribution to quantum physics. And it was verbalized in, in such a way that uh, that um, uh, Wolfgang Pauli and functioning uh, uh, functioning devices, mechanical devices, cannot uh, occupy the same uh, the same place. Jung also got uh, very powerful uh, confirmation from. Uh, Albert Einstein, who was invited to have lunch uh, with uh, the Jungs. And uh, Jung told him about his observations about synchronicity. And Einstein uh, encouraged him to pursue that because uh, the same kind of phenomena were uh, emerging in, in quantum physics. Now, this has to do with uh, something that has later been called uh, uh, Bell's theorem. It started actually from a situation where uh, Einstein was uh, questioning uh, the validity of quantum physics uh, because uh, it involves statistical operations uh, that uh, God doesn't uh, play dice. And uh, with Podolsky, he developed a kind of a thought experiment. Uh, what would happen? And this would be a very absurd situation if quantum physics were uh, true. And uh, the whole uh, experiment was to create a, a set of two uh, particles who would be uh, what's called entangled, which means uh, the uh, quantum measurements on them would be always uh, complementary. And then Einstein thought about uh, uh, removing these um, two particles uh, to a distance that uh, uh, the signal could not reach uh, from one particle to another uh, with the limit of the, of the speed of uh, light. And this was supposed to disprove uh, uh, quantum physics, and then uh, it was actually uh, confirmed by a number of uh, experiments that this is really something that is happening. So the, the um, conclusions from this was that the universe is uh, somehow radically non-local, that, uh, that what we perceive as distances does not, does not really uh, reflect, uh, reflect reality. I became very excited uh, about this phenomenon when I saw uh, elements of synchronicity of this kind happening uh, in people in psychedelic sessions, for example, having a, a past life experience in which uh, they uh, had an experience that involved uh, somebody who in their present life had some, had some uh, great, great uh, difficulties uh, in, in relating to, to that person. And when they were able to uh, resolve that, I found out that at exactly the same time, uh, significant changes happened in the feelings of the, of the other person, of the other protagonist, although that person didn't know anything about, uh, about this event. So 
it was as if these people were connected uh, in a way that uh, um, overcame uh, the, the distance between them. And there was no um, interpretation in linear causality about this. So I will now um, mention several uh, events uh, that are really important, uh, synchronistic events that can happen in connection with uh, um, work with holotropic states. Uh, the first one I would mention was uh, uh, something that happened in uh, a training uh, seminar that we did in a place called Pocket Ranch uh, in Hillsburg near, near uh, uh, Santa Rosa in, in uh, California. And uh, this was happening in a very, very um, um, rural sort of a forested area. Uh, there was a, a long uh, dirt road that was that was leading there, and uh, there were many many wild animals, uh, including rattlesnakes and uh, and deer and rabbits and so on. And we were doing a session, and uh, one of the participants had a very powerful shamanic uh, type of experience, in which she had the experience that that. Uh, an um, horned owl was her spirit um, animal, was their power, power animal. And then the session ended and she went for a walk into the forest and came back with um, a skeletal and, and uh, feather sort of uh, remnants of a, of a horned owl. But that continued then when she was driving back uh, uh, on the dirt road, she saw in a trench by the road uh, that something was moving, so she stopped and there was a wounded uh, horn owl and this owl uh, allowed her to pick him or her up, uh, put into the car and drive home where she was able to nurse the bird uh, to, to health. And uh, you know, this is not something that, that happens uh, very frequently to people. Um, even, even seeing a horn owl is a, is a fairly rare situation, but to find one uh, wounded uh, bird that would allow you to, to pick him or pick it up, uh, that certainly is extremely rare. And in connection with that uh, experience in the, in the holotropic breathwork session, it was really really an extraordinary uh, coincidence. She actually then had many shamanic experiences in her future sessions and actually introduced shamanism into her uh, psychological uh, practice. Uh, the other one I would like to mention was a situation uh, where we were doing a month-long uh, seminar and we invited uh, as a guest faculty uh, Michael Harner was a very, very wonderful uh, anthropologist who was in good academic standing, but he also experienced a shamanic initiation in uh, the Amazon, uh, in the jungle with uh, two uh, shamans uh, who gave him a mixture of Datura and Ayahuasca. It's a very, very powerful session that took him a long time to integrate, but he became really not just a great visionary anthropologist, but also a, a practicing shaman. And he came regularly with his wife, Sandy, uh, to as guest faculty to our month long seminars. And uh, this one particular visit was at a time when Christina was going through very powerful spiritual emergency and uh, very frequent uh, vision in these uh, uh, experiences that she had uh, were swans. Now, Michael didn't know anything about this when he was leading the group into a particular practice. Michael wrote a book, The Way of the Shaman, where he adopted uh, some shamanic practices from uh, all over the world uh, for the use in, in a workshop for, for Western audiences. And this one was um, an experience of uh, the Salish uh, 
uh, Spirit Canoe, the Savish are um, a Native American tribe in, in the Northwest United States. And this started so that uh, the room was darkened, Michael uh, and Sandy were uh, drumming, and the instruction was that we move until we have a sense that uh, we are in connection with uh, a certain animal, animal energy. And so after a while, you can see all kinds of sounds uh, from you know, birds to some kind of a uh, roaring sounds and, and people were moving in, in ways that uh, seem to represent uh, you know, animal, uh, animal uh, behavior. And then when we finished, uh, we sat in a, in a shape of a spindle and then uh, there was a kind of a fantasy uh, exercise where Michael asked us to imagine that we were in the form of our spirit animals and we were paddling and we were entering the hot springs, the, the underworld. And um, he would go there and look for a, an a animal who was the spirit animal that uh, uh, the person who was volunteering for the healing uh, lost. And Christina volunteered for this. Um, and uh, so we, we were sort of uh, uh, imagining that we were uh, paddling and Michael supposedly when he saw this, uh, this uh, spirit animal three times uh, gave the uh, uh, order for, for us to return very fast and then uh, did some uh, um, sort of this, uh, work of sucking out uh, the uh, inclusion in a shamanic way. And uh, then he turned to Christina and uh, whispered to her ear, your spirit bird is a white swan, which was quite, quite uh, remarkable considering that he didn't know that this was a main, uh, main animal in her experiences. And then she, uh, he asked her to, to dance a, a swan dance for the, for the group. Uh, now she felt considerably better after, after this uh, uh, particular exercise. But then the very interesting thing happened the next morning when we went uh, from our house up to Highway 1 to check our correspondence. And there was a letter from uh, a friend uh, of Christina's who was uh, also a follower of Swami Muktananda. And uh, this friend was sending Christina a photograph of Muktananda in which he was in a garden setting, sitting on a, on a swing. And uh, this one hand was, was pointing down to a flower pot, which was in the, in the shape of a swan and then his fingers were kind of in a and, and the expression the face were like uh, uh, you know expressing right uh, right on the target you know like this is this is it so there was a there was a three three elements sort of tied in this kind of synchronistic uh, synchronistic uh, package uh, Jung himself uh, gave a very interesting uh, very interesting um, example from his own practice, which became very famous. And he was working with a patient who showed quite a bit of resistance against his, uh, his uh, interpretations and his whole way of thinking. And uh, they were in the process of analyzing a dream in which uh, um, uh, an Egyptian scarab played a very important role and the patient was resisting. And while this was happening, something hit the, um, the window, the window pane. And uh, Jung got up and went to the window, opened it and came back with a beautiful example of uh, uh, Rose uh, Chafer. Um, you know, very rare specimen in that, in that area in, in Switzerland. And this was a, a very, first time then Jung even encountered this particular uh, species, uh, let alone in this, you know, very, very powerful synchronistic uh, connection. 
So uh, I would like to show you that the, the picture of that uh, gold uh, chafer. These are a couple of images of Jung, Jung in his uh, in his office and uh, a beautiful portrait of Jung. And this is the picture of the of the gold chafer. Okay, so the other very interesting uh, example uh, that I would like to uh, tell is, is also something that involves a, an insect. And it is uh, something about Joseph Campbell, who is very, very brilliant uh, mythologist, was very frequently in our workshops and in Esalen uh, doing his workshops. And in one of the workshops, he talked about Jung. He was a great uh, admirer of Jung and mentioned the word synchronicity. And somebody in the group uh, said, Joe, what is synchronicity? Can you explain it to us? And he gave uh, Jung's uh, definition of synchronicity. But then he said, I will give you a very personal example. Uh, he said, we uh, lived in uh, lower Manhattan on the 14th floor of an IRS building. And my um, office had two sets of windows one was overlooking Sixth Avenue, which was not a particularly interesting uh, view. And uh, we very seldom opened those windows, maybe just for cleaning. And the other set of the windows was overlooking uh, Hudson River, which was a beautiful view. So those windows were open uh, all the time. And then he said, and I was working on uh, the, the volume of, on uh, the way of the animal powers, which was a, uh, mythology of uh, shamanism and uh, he was working at that time on uh, the Kalahari Bushman mythology where the the major the heroic figure is praying mantis so he was surrounded by by articles about uh, praying mantis and pictures of uh, praying mantis and, and the book by uh, Lawrence Vander Post who um, grew up among the uh, uh, bush, uh, bush um, man, or he had, a, he had a bush nanny called Clara, and uh, uh, Lawrence Van der Post described uh, in his book that he observed frequently Clara really seemingly communicating meaningfully with the, with the praying mantis. So as he was in the middle of this activity, working on this chapter on the Kalahari Bushman, he suddenly had a totally uh, irrational impulse to go and open one of the windows that they never opened or, or very seldom opened. And uh, not knowing what he was doing, he stuck out his head and turned it to the left. And there on the uh, 14th floor of a high rise building in lower Manhattan was a great specimen of uh, praying mantis kind of climbing up uh, the building and supposedly turned towards him, looked into his uh, eyes, stayed for, for a while in that posture and then continued up. So again, you know, you can imagine that somehow uh, praying mantis gets into Manhattan. Somebody has it as a, as a pet or as it at home and it escapes. Uh, but the, it's very, very unlikely uh, in and of itself, but the fact that that it happened at a time when uh, Joseph Campbell was just full of these ideas about, about praying mantis related to Kalahari Bushmen, had this totally irrational impulse uh, to go and open the window that they never opened. Uh, this is a really remarkable synchronicity. It is very difficult to imagine the, uh, the statistical improbability of this kind of uh, event. So I will just show now, this is uh, what the praying mantis uh, looks like. Uh, I would now um, describe one synchronicity, which is by far the most uh, um, remarkable synchronicities in my life, or actually a series of uh, 
synchronicities. This happened in connection with uh, my first visit uh, to China, which was a, a trip uh, where the purpose was to bring transpersonal psychology into China and also doing holotropic breathwork uh, workshops. It was a small group of people. Uh, there was um, Bill Melton and, and Mei Xu who inspired and organized this. There were several facilitators and my brother with uh, his partner. And uh, we were doing several workshops, uh, holotropic breathwork workshops, and I did some lectures in China. And we were doing a uh, holotropic breathwork workshop in uh, Jinan, which was uh, the birthplace of uh, Confucius. And um, during the dinner, uh, one of the participants came to me and uh, told me that she had a dream about me. And I asked what the dream was about. And she said that her great grandmother, who's uh, a long time dead, appeared in the in the dream and said that uh, their family had a very precious uh, stone in uh, their family uh, possession, and that uh, this belongs to Dr. Grove that she should deliver to to Dr. Grove. And she uh, came to me um, with a beautiful, a beautiful. Um, blue uh, velvet uh, bag and then uh, opened it up and took out a fossil of a nautilus. I'll bring it closer so that you can see that. Now I have to say that uh, when we started the International Transpersonal Association, uh, we were for a long time uh, thinking about what logo we should use. And then we actually chose the Nautilus uh, logo uh, for that um, um, symbol of the International Transpersonal Association. Now here we were bringing Transpersonal Association into uh, China and uh, this grandmother uh, in a dream uh, tells a woman whose name actually was Meng, which means dream, to deliver a stone which had uh, the, the fossil that was uh, uh, used as a, as a logo for, the, for transpersonal psychology. And uh, another thing that I have to say, this is a marine fossil which uh, uh, you know, lives at the bottom of the ocean but it was collected at the top of Mount Everest. Uh, so at the time when uh, the Himalayas were, were created, which is estimated to be about 50 million years ago, supposedly the tectonic plates uh, collided and they started volcanic eruptions and then uh, this lifted and created the Himalayas. So this fossil is uh, older than the Himalayas, more than 50 million years. Uh, taken from the bottom of the ocean to the top of the highest mountain uh, in the world. And it happens to be a symbol of uh, the International Transpersonal Association. So this uh, brought a lot of uh, attention of the, of the Chinese uh, press. They didn't pay much attention to the holotropic breathwork and what that did, but uh, the synchronicity really attracted uh, their attention. Uh, I should say that during this expedition, we had several other very remarkable synchronicities. I will just very uh, quickly mention it because uh, we almost lived like in a kind of a magical reality where these unusual things were happening. Uh, the first thing that happened, uh, we found out that uh, Jack Cornfield, who was visiting uh, uh, Singapore, attending a Buddhist conference, had uh, by his organizers a, a side trip scheduled to Beijing that uh, took him to the University of Beijing on the same day that uh, I was independently scheduled by the people who organized my trip. Now, uh, Jack is an old dear friend. We have done many things together, but we never met in another city without really planning it ahead of time. And this was of all places uh, 
uh, uh, Beijing where we sort of uh, collided. So that was really also unusual uh, coincidence. We, we ended up uh, actually sharing that evening and it was a discussion between Groff and Cornfield instead of a separate uh, uh, lecture by, by either of us. And there was another quite mind-blowing uh, synchronicity that happened. We, after this uh, uh, breathwork in Jinan, we were traveling to, uh, to Beijing and uh, there were two people who were uh, joining us on that tour and uh, came into the same train where we were traveling. This was agreed upon ahead of time. But they bought tickets uh, quite independently, one in north uh, of China, the, the second one in the south of China. They ended by coincidence not only in the same wagon and the same uh, compartment where our group was sitting, but they were sharing adjacent, uh, adjacent uh, uh, seats. So there were many, many things like this that were happening uh, that, uh, you know, make us feel that we were living in a somewhat unusual uh, world. Kind of a, it had a magic, magic uh, touch to it. So I will think I, I will end here with um, uh, just showing you uh, the uh, picture of that Nautilus. So this is a, a close-up of the Nautilus shell, how, how it was held in the hands. And this is uh, the symbol for the ITA as we were using it either in connection with the inscription ITA or then in a more kind of a stylized geometrical way uh, in some other contexts. So I will uh, end up this my independent part and I will bring in uh, Rick who uh, We'll first um, add some um, you know, important things to the concept of synchronicity itself. And was uh, doing a whole, uh, whole uh, uh, course on it at, at CIS. And then uh, we bring in astrology, which uh, will present uh, synchronicity not in uh, the form of the sort of uh, uh, you know, separate, isolated, uh, minor happening, but shows how uh, synchronicity really permeates the entire fabric uh, of existence. And um, also in that connection, um, the important role that uh, archetypal astrology plays not only in consciousness research, but in many, many other disciplines, many other aspects of uh, human life. Well, hello everyone. Um, I'm uh, grateful to this uh, you know, for this opportunity uh, from Stan to join with you to present a few uh, words about both the remarkable phenomenon of synchronicity and uh, and then also, uh, as Stan mentioned, um, the even more remarkable phenomenon of what Jung saw as being a kind of an apparent example of synchronicity on a cosmic scale where astrology uh, uh, astro correlations between the planetary movements and uh, the archetypal patterns of human experience, both in individual psychology, uh, individual biographies, but also on the collective level seems to uh, occur. So we'll address that uh, second form in a few minutes, but first I just wanted to say a few words uh, here uh, in it, adding on to, to what Stan described. Um, so the, um, what's remarkable about the concept of synchronicity is that in no other era prior to the modern would that concept or phenomenon need to be uh, need to be named and uh, conceptualized. It, it's only in the modern worldview where we are uh, 
have the assumption that the that the world apart from human consciousness is essentially uh, um, neutralized of any capacity for meaning or or, or uh, purpose that it is uh, unconscious random uh, uh, mechanistic um, it's only in such a worldview that the uh, apparent meaningful coincidence between inner events and outer events with no uh, causal connection um, visible. It's only in, in the modern worldview that synchronicities would even need to be um, conceptualized uh, or seen as anomalous. Um, in the primordial worldview, uh, characteristic of indigenous cultures, tribal uh, societies, uh, these are just seen as being uh, part of the fabric of life, uh, one, something one is constantly attentive to. And similarly, uh, in, in a more theistic um, worldview, these would be seen as being uh, expressions of, of God's will, of providence, and so forth. So it's only in the modern worldview that, that <clears throat> Jung recognized that we need to come up with some uh, understanding of this phenomenon, which he, he found uh, happening with uh, considerable frequency and uh, significance uh, in his own life and also in the lives of his, uh, of his patients. Uh, Percy Bridgman, the, uh, the physicist and uh, philosopher of science taught at MIT, he once said, uh, coincidences are what are left over uh, after you've applied a bad theory. And uh, that's exactly what synchronicities are, including astrological synchronicities. And what Jung uh, was essentially attempting to do is to come up with a good theory, one that was uh, adequate to the, um, to the evidence. Um, it's easier for the reductionist mindset to negate the, uh, the importance of, of, of such coincidences, seeing them as just being subjective and uh, uh, projected and, and, and so forth, than to actually deal with, with just how uh, remarkable they are, including how often they happen in, the lives of, uh, in their own lives. I read uh, recently a, quite a compelling description of a synchronicity that was by a man named um, is Michael Shermer, who is uh, a, a, the head of a, um, a skeptical society, and it was quite a moving description. Um, so you can uh, of, a, of such a synchronicity. So uh, these things tend to happen to all of us. Now, one thing uh, in our own context that's important to th think be aware of with uh, synchronicity is how in, as we get more and more into the postmodern um, uh, frame of mind where all horizons of meaning have been erased, as Nietzsche uh, would put it, uh, that the need uh, or the search for some encompassing uh, meaning or at least uh, clues to what's happening into, uh, in our lives can be such that synchronicities, which are noted by uh, so many of us, take on a, an even greater importance because of the uh, uh, otherwise metaphysical disorientation of the, of the contemporary sensibility. And um, I, uh, there, I have a friend named Jeff Kripal, a uh, distinguished uh, um, scholar of religious studies, and he uh, he once said to me, you know, I have come to uh, uh, stop believing in almost everything, but I do believe in synchronicities, and that perfectly captures uh, the the role of synchronicities in many people's lives as they attend to these seemingly uh, uh, significant indications of something more, something that may be directing our lives to, uh, in such a way that uh, helps us live more, more skillfully uh, 
and maybe even more than that, helps us recognize that we are in uh, a world that in some sense, in some sense is uh, attending to us or is meaningfully focused on our lives, that we're not just a, uh, a kind of random epiphenomenon. Now, what's remarkable in Jung's life is that uh, when, you, when you read the two, both the essay, the larger monograph on synchronicity and a causal connecting principle, or his lecture that he gave uh, in 1951 at Aronos that Stan was talking about, uh, you generally um, have the sense that he's, he puts a great deal of focus on um, parapsychological evidence, on, uh, the, on scientific uh, quantitative um, quantum uh, relativity uh, and uh, quantum uh, relativistic physics. And um, what's remarkable is that even though that's a little bit more the focus of those essays, it's the more personally, psychologically transformative and, 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 and meaningful forms of synchronicity, uh, such as his example of the golden scarab case, where the, the, um, that, uh, the golden scarab uh, flies into the, through the window, uh, tapping at it, uh, right as the skeptical um, patient is, is discussing a dream in which uh, the, uh, a uh, gold, golden scarab um, a piece of jewelry was being handed to her <clears throat> and Jung recognized right away the deeper mythic uh, implications of this symbol of, of, of rebirth from Egyptian myth. Uh, it's that type of synchronicity that was in fact much more important in, in Jung's uh, own life and that he attended to in that of his, the lives of his patients as well. I think now here some uh, 60 years after uh, Jung's um, uh, formulation of synchronicity, we can discern three basic uh, stages in our uh, experience of synchronicities um, that typically happen in people's lives. The first is where you have, the, where the, the synchronicities are kind of uh, very, um, modest in nature, kind of uh, elusive, uh, slightly provocative, puzzling, um, uh, but uh, not, not, they could be, they can be dismissed because they seem like it just could be one of these uh, coincidences that uh, are on the one hand, make one right, raise one's eyebrow, but on the other hand, nothing too much can be made of it. Oh, good. These things happen to us all the time. Uh, could be um, think, thinking of somebody and then the phone rings, that type of thing. Uh, but uh, even something like one day, Stan uh, and I were, we had taught a class in San Francisco at, at CIS and we were driving back home towards the Golden Gate Bridge uh, 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 to cross to, to our homes are in Marin. And we were going down one of those very, uh, steep hills that are, are characteristic of San Francisco, looking down uh, towards the bay as we are uh, driving steeply down. And as uh, when you come to the, the cross streets, it evens out, uh, it levels out. And then uh, as soon as you cross the cross street, you're back down into a steep uh, incline again. And as we were doing this, and if you do it at uh, something of any kind of speed, um, you can feel what happens much more uh, radically if you were doing this at a very fast speed, which is, of course, of course what happens in a lot of chase scenes in movies uh, that are situated in San Francisco. And so I, as we were doing this, I, I was talking about how frequent you see these now in movies, these kinds of scenes, and I hazarded just offhand this kind of connecting of it to uh, the movie French Connection, uh, where, where um, chase, the car chase scenes in the cities were very prominent. And uh, not even 30 seconds later, as we stop at the next such cross street, a big bus comes right ac uh, across our uh, visual field in front of Stan's and my car. 
and uh, on the side of the bus was a, a, a big poster that said, um, see the French connection. And uh, <clears throat> we just kind of looked at each other and shook our heads and just thought like, what is it about the cosmos that it seems to delight in these kinds of um, uh, sort of trickster, uh, like a sense of humor as Stan mentioned but not anything that one could imagine as being too significant. And again, it could be just disregarded as not being um, anything deeply meaningful. But um, the second stage of synchronistic experience is reached when something like the gold, golden scarab uh, case happens, where something so um, personally meaningful or coming right at an important moment, uh, a threshold moment, Often it's in times of, at times of uh, births, uh, deaths, and um, uh, psychological uh, or biographical crises of one kind or another. These are all threshold moments. And it's often it's at those times that uh, synchronicities can occur that have much greater, uh, almost like spiritual and metaphysical consequence. And they can, they can actually change one's worldview. Uh, and then in the third case, in the third stage, you've already had your worldview shifted. You're open to the fact that uh, um, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in the conventional philosophy. Uh, and uh, in this case, though, we're, we're now, um, it's more a matter of being, you, you see the synchronicities, you see these uh, patterns, and you recognize them as part of life's continuing uh, self-revelation of meaning uh, it, it, as it, that can have just an aesthetic quality. It, it, life is a work of art. It can have like a, a sense of humor, uh, the, the cosmic trickster, as, as we were just discussing. Um, uh, but there also can be um, a quality of continual, um, as it were, communication from the whole to the part, that is from the, our, our, our surroundings, from nature, from the universe, to ourselves, our consciousness, which is a part of the whole, uh, as, a, um, as something that uh, helps orient us, uh, that, that uh, nourishes us. Um, it's an expression of the care of the universe in some ways, and uh, also can give uh, a, a put potential for kind of like cycle for what Jung would call uh, a compensation to, for the one-sidedness of uh, the conscious attitude in the same way the dreams are. And uh, Jung, let me give one uh, example of this that happened in Jung's life where uh, this was, dis this was um, reported after he died by a colleague of of Jung's named Heinrich Fierz, and it's written up in a book, uh, uh, it's in a couple of books, uh, Robert Aziz's book on uh, synchronicity and Jung's psychology of religion. I first read it in a, uh, a book of, called Remembrances of C.G. Jung, Emma Jung, and Tony Wolf uh, when I was at the Jung Institute in Zurich uh, many years ago. And in this uh, uh, example, what happened was you, you, um, Heinrich Fiertz was requested to go see uh, Jung to talk about, this is in the 1950s when he was in his uh, late 70s or early 80s, and he was asked, uh, Heinrich Fiertz was asked to talk to Jung about whether a manuscript that had been left behind by a deceased uh, uh, scientist uh, should be published. And, uh, so the appointment was at five o'clock at Jung's house, uh, uh, and they, they met. And um, soon, a, a few minutes after the um, beginning of the meeting, um, Jung was feeling that this book, this manuscript, should not be published. And but the discussion continued, and Jung finally started getting a little bit sharp uh, in his uh, negativity about it and then looked at his watch and uh, a puzzled look came over his face and he said, well, that's odd. Uh, 
what time um, did we uh, begin our conversation? And Heinrich said, oh, 5 p.m., as we uh, had agreed. And Jung said, that's very strange. I've just had my, uh, my watch uh, completely uh, uh, revisioned. It was working perfectly uh, uh, by the, operated on by the, the great Swiss watchmakers. And uh, yet uh, my watch says it's five after five. Uh, and you're, you know, he had asked Heinrich, what time is it? And Heinrich had said it's 5.35. Uh, and so he said, Jung said, your, your watch is correct, mine is wrong. Let's start this discussion over again, which they did. And then Jung heard the uh, argument, the presentation in a very different way and came to the conclusion that indeed the uh, manuscript should be published, which it was to, uh, to us with a successful outcome. Now, I give this uh, example um, because it, uh, it first of all shows that Jung, um, First of all, notice how he was constantly alert to uh, reading symbolic meaning in uh, the field around him and in, in, in events. He, he, he could read the symbolic meaning, namely the stoppage of the watch and its malfunction, exactly matched in time what he now saw was a stoppage of thinking, uh, 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 a dysfunction on his own uh, mind's part. He made the connection and then uh, re-initiated uh, the conversation from that point of view. So he, he can read the symbolic meaning the way other people read the newspaper. Um, but in addition, he, um, he's open to, that, to the idea that the external world, nature, uh, a watch, the, the non-human world can be carrying meaning and uh, in some sense, the whole can be communicating something to human consciousness. And uh, the, th the third point about this little um, story to note is that how this is just part of Jung's everyday experience. He's always alert to these kinds of things. People, patients would report that he would, he would be alert to the, when the energy would get more intense, the, the emotional charge in the therapeutic uh, room where he was seeing a patient in the garden room there by a lake in his house near the lake side, he would be alert to the wind getting stronger and waves lapping louder uh, or, or a, a, a flock of birds suddenly landing outside. He was alert to synchronistic uh, events all the time, rather different than his description in the essay where the focus is on um, uh, sporadic uh, uh, and, and relatively infrequent um, anomalies. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, notice that he used the synchronicity uh, not to, um, he used it to, to correct himself. He saw that, and he saw that he was leaving something out. Uh, he, he used it to compensate the one-sidedness of this conscious attitude. And that's always Jung's view of the unconscious. And, um, and this brings up the fact that uh, synchronicities can have like a kind of uh, potential shadow side, one of which is the, the potential for inflated narcissistic interpretations, <clears throat> somewhat characteristic of of the more superficial side of the new age, uh, which in which one is always reading um, kind of promiscuously uh, meanings as focused on oneself, how, how important I am and kind of inflating the trivial uh, to uh, basically uh, fortify one's own sense of, of weak uh, self-importance and um, as Jung says, this is like a pre-Copernican view. It's, it's, acts, it's focusing on the ego rather than the self with a capital S. And Jung said the full, uh, uh, the, the true interpretation of a synchronicity is uh, frequently a defeat for the ego and a victory for the self. And then uh, a second, a shadow form of synchronicity is the uh, potential for um, a 
paranoid interpretations where one is seeing everything as being, uh, Jung called it, morbidly focused on the self. And he said in those cases, the, the, it's usually, uh, it's always seen as being other human beings who are, who are creating this plot against one and, and one is reading all the clues and weaving them together into a nefarious plot that's aimed at, at oneself. Um, as, as he said, as Jung said, this is, uh, it's, it's morbid, it's egocentric, and it lacks eros. It, uh, it lacks a sense of the sympathy of all things. Um, and then the third uh, uh, is a different type of um, synchronicity where, um, where there can be a convergence of, of, of negative events happening seemingly way out of proportion to what would be the normal sequence of events, as if um, the universe is kind of ganging up on one. And uh, we see this, uh, Stan and I have talked about this a number of times, where there's, uh, especially where one is going through certain uh, parts of <clears throat> the spiritual journey, such as uh, the perinatal sequence, where one is facing, uh, getting close to ego death, and uh, one, will attract towards one um, external events that will uh, converge with a kind of uncanny frequency and intensity to, um, to basically defeat oneself, to create a, a kind of ego death situation externally. And in this case, uh, what's called for is basically a continuing inter interior, uh, interior transform transformational uh, inner work so that one is, uh, one can move into a different gestalt and, and uh, then one often notices that the quality of synchronicities of coincidences and so forth uh, starts to move into a much more uh, benevolent um, form. And this seems to reflect basically the fact that we are, um, we are not skin encapsulated egos, but we are embedded in larger fields of meaning in which uh, the energies that we, our deep psyche is um, uh, putting out there is also drawing towards us, uh, especially uh, drawing towards us, as Jung would say, as fate, what we are denying uh, to our consciousness and keeping it to the unconscious. So those are just a few uh, uh, thoughts of uh, a few additional um, uh, thoughts about synchronicity that uh, uh, I thought I would just add to uh, what Stan has said. And I think um, uh, the, the overall vision of, of life as being a, uh, informed through and through with uh, significance, with uh, meaning, uh, and that it's not something uh, that meaning and significance, spiritual purpose, values, and so forth, are not just uh, human uh, categories, uh, but that they are in some sense embedded in the very nature of the cosmos in which we are participants. So with that, I'm going to pass uh, the uh, uh, chair over to Stan to say a few words about um, uh, the, uh, the bridge from depth psychology, transpersonal psychology, and uh, our research in that area, uh, opening up into the uh, archetypal astrological uh, evidence. Well, thank you, Rick, very much for those uh, wonderful uh, comments and additions. Um, I think particularly that the last thing was, was very important. Uh, at the beginning, I mentioned that uh, the um, existence of synchronicity can uh, help certain people on the spiritual journey and in a very positive way, but it also has certain pitfalls. And you mentioned the two extremes when it leads to inflation and the other one when it's sort of a, a, a kind of a accumulation of, of threatening uh, synchronicities that can lead even to paranoid state. But I think there's, a, there's an important uh, comment to make about uh, current psychiatry, that uh, psychiatry does not know that phenomenon of, uh, of uh, synchronicity. So even if you had somebody who would, with a very even mind, just simply describe the, 
the amazing synchronicity and, and express the surprise about it, that would be enough to give them pathological uh, diagnosis. Of, uh, the, the terminology is uh, delusion of reference. In other words, uh, finding uh, a relation to one's own personality in events that have nothing to nothing to do. In other words, it's the, it's the correct observation of the phenomenon themselves. Whereas the, in all those situations, actually, there's the phenomenon of synchronicity, of accumulation, meaningful, meaningful uh, connections is, is accurate, but it can be misinterpreted either in, this, in the terms of inflation or in terms of, uh, in terms of um, uh, the paranoid interpretation that the, you know, it doesn't have to be the, uh, the quality of observation that's wrong. It's just describing the, the phenomena. It's just what you do with it. And this is why it's important for people who are involved in this uh, kind of self-exploration to know the phenomenon of, uh, of synchronicity uh, and be very careful how they sort of uh, report it because it's very easy to get a diagnosis for, for synchronicity. So we now come to uh, the largest sort of importance of synchronicity, where synchronicity is built into uh, the fabric of existence itself. It's not just manifesting in certain insular uh, events. And uh, this has something to do with our uh, cooperation, but now it's over 40 years uh, when we are kind of a team where uh, Rick is a full-time, very brilliant uh, uh, astrologer, and uh, you know my you know, uh, full-time uh, profession is is um, working with non ordinary states. So I was mostly presenting the observations, and Rick is bringing the the uh, interpretation. You know. uh, so this started. Uh, um, about four, over 40 years at Esalen when Rick came uh, to um, uh, invite me to be um, in his committee for, for dissertation that he was writing on LSD psychotherapy. And uh, we were sort of uh, brought together by some, again, amazing uh, synchronicity, if you want. Uh, Rick was looking for a connection with me and it turned out that just the only place that was available at Esalen was in the house where we lived, just, uh, you know, in the one floor uh, lower, there, there was a little studio. And so this began, uh, you know, our close friendship and also years, decades of, of cooperation. And as we were looking at the um, phenomena that were happening in psychedelic sessions, uh, there was a man, Arne Tretevik, who, who came to Esalen. He was a, uh, somebody who really lived astrology, was uh, walking, uh, walking around, uh, you know, with uh, ephemeris and was sort of observing what's happening around him and what was happening to him and, and uh, finding the correlations. And he's the one who told us, why don't you use astrology? Astrology would really help, help you in this work. And at that point, time we were sort of uh, open sufficiently to listen to him and try and so he taught us how to how to actually uh, cut the, the chart and uh, we started uh, looking into it and then uh, what what happened was very very interesting that uh, that certain things that i formulated in my uh, uh, work with psychedelics suddenly started making sense uh, astrologically. Uh, it turned out that the four perinatal matrices that we talked about and we have shown in the in the slideshow just uh, uh, exactly correspond to uh, the uh, astrological archetypes. So you could be almost reading an handbook of astrology when you read about these matrices. Uh, and I think I talked about it. That there's a significant uh, overlapping with the description of uh, uh, Neptune and the first matrix, the Saturn and the second matrix, uh, the uh, third matrix and Pluto and the fourth matrix and matrix and Uranus. I mean, it's a little more complicated because the transits involve more than one planet, so it's a 
there is sort of interaction of those planets and coloring, but there was certainly significant uh, overlap in that. And then uh, Rick observed something really phenomenal that not only was the discorrelation, but that people actually had had uh, the confrontation with those matrices at the time when they had the uh, transits of the corresponding uh, uh, planets. So it turned out that there's a possibility of, of predict archetypically the, the content of the experiences and then there also the transits you get the you get the, the timing of those episodes which is particularly interesting in relation to spiritual uh, emergencies with the certain beginning and uh, and ending and uh, so even possible to say when there would be a risk of something similar happening in the future so for me this was extremely important because from the beginning of our work we were very much uh, interested in finding something that would predict the uh, results of uh, psychedelic sessions. In the early work, we actually chose specifically <clears throat> patients who had very difficult uh, conditions where, where nothing else helped. And it was essential to have some kind of a tool that would give us a sense what we might expect. And we were using a whole a series of tests, uh, MMPI, Rorschach, the DAT, POI and so on, and uh, looking for correlations, you know, with the between the, the content of the sessions and the outcome, and we simply did not find any any significant correlations. Now it was great uh, irony that when we found the tool, this, uh, archetypal astrology, that could really give a significant uh, prediction, that it was more controversial than uh, psychedelics uh, uh, themselves. Uh, but it really turned out to be an amazing tool. Uh, I like to talk about it as a Rosetta Stone of, uh, of uh, consciousness research. So this was the, the beginning of, of our work. And then, uh, you know, we uh, continued over the years uh, exchanging uh, information, looking at the astronomical correlations. Uh, Rick, in the meantime, temporarily was kind of de, uh, detracted, I would say. Uh, got very fascinated by historical research and spent really 30 years focusing, not exclusively, but, but I would say primarily on the historical uh, correlations. And uh, uh, there was a wonderful book, uh, Passion of the Western Mind, that came as a kind of side product of this when he started uh, writing the uh, introduction to the book of uh, uh, astrology and then it started growing until it became you know very very independent scholarly uh, description of the historical uh, correlates or correlates with historical events and then uh, you know finally the psyche and cosmos uh, came out which was uh, specifically focusing on on uh, astrology and we have done many uh, workshops and courses uh, called uh, Psyche and Cosmos, you know, the uh, uh, relationship between what's happening in what I call holotropic states of consciousness and the corresponding uh, planetary uh, transits. And we were very lucky to find an unbelievably uh, open-minded school that uh, allowed us to teach these in courses that actually became very, very popular and very well attended. So I will just give it again to Rick to, to share with you the, the uh, significance of synchronicity for uh, astrology that gives us a really a whole different uh, uh, scale of meaning. Uh, thank you again, Stan, for the um, uh, introduction to this. So, uh, Maybe I'll just say uh, one quick word of uh, clarification. Um, I think particularly in the, the work that uh, Stan and I've done together over the 40 plus years, he, as he said, was providing um, so much of the uh, psychological uh, evidence for first all the, um, the, the 
summary of session reports from the psychedelic therapy, LSD therapy, and, and uh, other uh, psychedelic um, uh, medicine research, but then uh, holotropic breathwork as well. And I was, I was bringing in, um, I kind of specialized in noting the archetypal uh, planetary correlations and was studying the astrological side of this. this. But um, I actually then, rather than being a full-time um, astrologer, I've actually been a full-time uh, professor of philosophy uh, and cultural history, really, at uh, California Institute of Integral Studies, while ceaselessly um, doing this astrological research at the same time, because in some ways it's the most uh, extraordinary uh, source of um, kind of illumination and continual uh, uh, opening of a deeper grasp of um, not only of, of the uh, individual human psyche, but also the collective. And so that's why uh, that the, the two books uh, that Stan mentioned, The Passion of the Western Mind and Cosmos and Psyche, took the form that they did. I should uh, clarify also, The Passion of the Western Mind is, is, is entirely non-astrological. I, I was setting out basically the evolution of the Western worldview as our understanding of archetypes shifted from the mythological Homeric perspective uh, that was what, essentially pervading archaic Greece, for example, and Rome, uh, to the uh, Platonic um, uh, archetypes. That's where the term comes from, is the Platonic philosophical tradition, where archetypes are seen as being the fundamental um, uh, forms that structure the, 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 the cosmos and uh, the human soul as one in, integrated uh, uh, and, uh, field that, in other words, the archetypes <clears throat> are the uh, fundamental principles of reality itself. But then when Jung recovers the concept uh, of, of archetypes, his focus is very much on them being uh, psychological and uh, even intra-psychic as they remain for many um, uh, Jungian uh, therapists, for example. But uh, it was in Jung's later work that he, with that we've been describing here with synchronicities in particular, and including his studies in astrology, that convinced him that archetypes uh, were not just um, uh, expressions of something that is uh, subjectively human, even if shared by all humans, but that seems to inform uh, the cosmos itself. And in that move, Jung begins to break out of the um, kind of bubble of the uh, mechanistic cosmos enclosing the uh, human psyche and uh, moves towards, in a way, a, a more platonic uh, understanding of the archetypes, as well as Homeric, because the archetypes seem to be at once uh, gods and goddesses that people have quite powerful experiences of in non-ordinary states of consciousness, and, uh, but they also can be experienced as, as principles, like the, prince, the archetype of, of beauty or uh, the um, archetypal principle that uh, drives the uh, impulse for uh, sudden change, liberation, breakthroughs, and so forth, or the trickster archetype. Um, so it, it was certainly a, a great astonishment to both of us when we saw uh, the extent to which astrology had, had uh, relevance um, to understanding psychedelic sessions. And uh, when I um, first grasped that it's, uh, its potential in this way, um, it was like suddenly having a, a, a light go on in, in, in the cave because we basically, up until that point, were, were dealing with the, with the mystery of how um, to understand the extreme variability of psychedelic experiences 
uh, from one person to the next, but also the same person at different times. And what we found was that as the, um, that it depended on uh, where the planets were uh, in the sky relative to where they were uh, in a person, at a person's birth, uh, as to what archetypal complexes would uh, be activated at, at, at a given time, and that these came through uh, quite vividly in the uh, psychedelic <clears throat> sessions. They seem to come through all the time in, in individual and, uh, lives and in the life of the um, collective psyche, but there's something about psychedelic sessions that makes the archetypal just pop out with, with much greater intensity, vividness, uh, and ease of, of, uh, uh, of specifying uh, uh, what, what's, what is the uh, archetypal principle at work because they often take the form of uh, not only their emotional intensity, their, 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 uh, the intensity of meaning, but they often can take a numinous form uh, uh, of, as a mythic being uh, that is quite distinctly archetypal. So it was relatively easy to be reading these astrological textbooks uh, from past uh, centuries or from the 20th century when astrology became much more psychologically uh, focused um, with the work of Dane Rudyard, Robert Hand, Liz Green, um, uh, Stephen Arroyo, and others. Um, it was quite evident to uh, me as I was reading such texts and correlating the transits uh, with people's psychedelic experiences <clears throat> to see that these um, that behind the the planets were the archetypes and i should make clear that uh, the evidence doesn't point to a kind of mechanistic linear causality uh, as if the planets are somehow uh, determining uh, uh, our experience in the way that uh, one billiard ball hits another billiard ball and and uh, forces it in a particular direction with a particular momentum uh, uh, in a kind of you know Newtonian Cartesian manner. Uh, the uh, analogy that uh, we often use, I, I first heard Rob Hand use it, uh, is the idea is the um, uh, example of a clock. Uh, Right now, the clock says that it is 6.46 p.m. That, uh, the hands on the clock are not causing the time to be 6.46. Rather, they are indicating it. Uh, they are a reflection of a larger um, uh, gestalt. And uh, it's the same with the planets, that it's, it's as if, in terms of, of synchronicities. I love the uh, beautiful passage from Plotinus, the great uh, late classical uh, philosopher, founder of Neoplatonism, when he was uh, talking about how uh, astrology worked, um, he said he saw uh, that the, that it's not that there is a, uh, that the, there's a kind of determining mechanism coming from the stars or the planets onto human affairs. Rather, he said, uh, the world is full of uh, signs and meaning. It's pervaded by it. Uh, and the movements of the planets are like a, a kind of uh, script of the anima mundi up uh, uh, available for our, our um, understanding. And he said, uh, everything in the world is interconnected. Uh, as has been said, um, everything breathes together. That idea of everything breathing together, I think perfectly conveys this idea of uh, that our psyches are embedded in not just a human collective psyche, but a, a cosmic psyche, uh, an, a soul of the world, a, an anima mundi. Uh, that is archetypally uh, informed and that the, the, the movements of the planets seem to uh, correlate with remarkable uh, uh, precision, pre precision and nuance uh, uh, with the um, 
uh, unfolding uh, archetypal patterns of our lives, including in dreams, very helpful for dream interpretation, uh, uh, as well as for um, uh, understanding our, our uh, works of art or uh, moments in history. Uh, we're doing a whole film, um, uh, that are, a film is being made by the head of Bioneers, uh, Kenny Ossibel, uh, with John Cleese as uh, our a friend of Stan's and mine is the, is the host that's focused on um, our, our era uh, using the uh, astrological perspective set up forth in my book, Cosmos and Psyche, and par which particularly shows, talks about uh, uh, where, how our era is connected to other uh, preceding uh, times of planetary alignments, such as uh, happened in the 1960s or the French Revolutionary Epoch uh, that we are in right now. Um, it's very important also to uh, point out that astrology, as we see it working, does not point to a kind of fatalistic um, uh, specificity of determinism. Astrology, uh, the way I would put it, is that astrology is not concretely predictive. It is archetypally predictive. It gives us a sense for uh, the larger uh, range of archetypal meanings that are relevant to that particular uh, prim primordial principle. Um, but there is a, a wide range of ways in which, say, um, Saturn can come through as, as, as limitation, but also as grounding, as oppression or depression, uh, uh, constriction, um, but also as uh, something that, that uh, gives us um, uh, uh, firmness or endurance or uh, a, 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 a foundational uh, rootedness in tradition, for example. Um, the, the implication here is that our transits, uh, you can have a, a transit that is often seen at the time when people suddenly unexpectedly fall in love uh, and have an awakening of uh, Aphrodite, as it were, in their life, like a Uranus-Venus conjunction transit. Um, but the same transit often coincides with sudden breakthroughs uh, that are of a more aesthetic variety. Um, art can either be experienced with greater uh, sudden kind of a, a vividness, a kind of awakening to a, a, the, a new dimension of beauty in music that you've heard many times and now suddenly are hearing it in a new way. Or if you are an artist, or even if you haven't been an artist, there can be an awakening of a new uh, artistic uh, capacity. Um, uh, and these are like alternative valences of the same essential archetypal complex. And um, by the, this uh, multivalence of the archetypal meanings being something that we see over and over again, it gives us the, what I will call the ontological space for free will. It, it permits um, uh, the possibility of an archetypal, um, uh, an archetypally informed flow of human experience that is at the same time open to our participation, our co-creative inflection in, in, in various ways. Uh, and in fact, the more, um, the more consciousness that we bring to the, uh, the unfolding of these archetypal energies, the less likely we are to be unconscious puppets uh, acting them out in destructive ways uh, and more likely to be kind of skillful, intelligent, um, like uh, uh, yeah, co-creative participants in, in the uh, expression, the manifestation of the gods and goddesses, the archetypes in, in, uh, in our lives. So I think these are important um, uh, points to make so because it is very easy uh, for those who are 
so, you know, so a, a kind of skeptical attitude that comes from uh, believing that everything has to be explicable in a kind of Newtonian Cartesian way uh, to then apply that quite uh, irrelevantly to um, the, the great mystery of, of the uh, uh, relationship between psyche and cosmos. And as a result of that misunderstanding, that misapplication, it's very easy to just negate uh, uh, astrology uh, and, and correlations such as this as simply being impossible. Uh, as I often say, in our era, uh, astrology is the gold standard of superstition uh, in our culture. It's, it's a thing that you compare uh, uh, something to if you want to make a point about how ludicrous and unworthy of serious intellectual uh, uh, attention something is, then you'll say it's, it's no better than astrology. Um, and I think this is one of the great, um, oh, uh, certainly uh, paradoxes and ironies of, of both stands in my um, lives is, is that um, something of so low a position in the cultural intelligentsia's uh, understanding turns out to have such uh, profound and encompassing significance, illuminating pretty much everything that uh, one, whether it's uh, history or psychology or art, uh, uh, economics, um, there, there is, is scarcely any um, field of human uh, endeavor and, and athletics and so forth that isn't, isn't uh, illuminated by uh, uh, focusing the astrological and particularly the archetypal astrological lens onto it. I'll just say a, a couple of words by way of, uh, I, kn I know, uh, many people in the courses that Stan and I have taught uh, for quite a few years at, at uh, California Institute of Integral Studies um, in, the, in the Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness program, but also in, in seminars uh, and workshops that we've given around the world. One of the things that people often naturally are interested in is how can we use the, the, the knowledge of these correlations so that uh, we can better time uh, our sessions, whether it's a holotropic breathwork session or a journey to uh, Peru to work with a shaman uh, in, doing ayahuasca circles uh, or um, perhaps uh, a, uh, an MDMA um, therapy session um, for a couple to, to have uh, and so forth. And indeed, these are... Uh, this is, this, is, this is a very legitimate interest and, and in fact, we have a lot of, of uh, insights that we've gained over the years by uh, studying very carefully what, what transits were people having when they had the, the different experiences. Um, and I think uh, I could, one could hardly do justice to uh, the, um, to the subject matter in, in, the, in the few minutes that uh, we have remaining here. But uh, it's, let me just point out a few uh, major themes uh, or principles to keep in mind. Uh, I'll also mention, mention uh, um, some other resources that you can go to to, to pursue this further. Uh, in general, um, it's the outer planet transits that are of the most uh, significance. Um, the, the, the movements of the sun, uh, the moon, uh, Mercury, Venus, Mars, are, they're relatively uh, rapid. Uh, the, their, their transits across the birth, any particular point in the birth chart are relatively uh, brief. And while they certainly are evidenced in the uh, in the, in a psychedelic session. Even the moon transits, which last for eight hours or so, are, can be quite um, notable, noticeable in 
in the in an eight hour uh, LSD session. Or eight, but um, on the other hand, uh, the outer planet transits, which last for uh, in the case of uh, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, several years at a time, and Saturn, uh, uh, some better part of a year, except in the case of the Saturn returns, which uh, between age 28 and 30, and again in the late 50s, approaching age 60, uh, can last about three years. Um, these transits are uh, seem to correlate with much more profound archetypal mm, uh, potentials, uh, uh, qualities that pervade the psychic field. Uh, and uh, we have uh, transits of, of Uranus seem to be especially present at times of breakthroughs, um, sudden, uh, unexpected, uh, changes, awakenings, they can, these can sometimes be breakdowns, uh, sudden collapses of structures, uh, and so forth, that can be uh, part of a larger movement through into a breakthrough. Uh, but that quality of the, um, of, of, of the sudden, of sudden change, sudden awakening, uh, uh, sudden liberation from old paradigms or, or re rebirth experiences, uh, seem to uh, frequently coincide with um, Uranus, either as the transiting uh, uh, planet or as the planet in the birth chart that is being transited by uh, another planet, um, such as uh, Neptune or Pluto or, or Jupiter. In fact, Jupiter-Uranus um, alignments tend to, that combination, uh, seems to be one that we see most frequently uh, uh, coinciding with times of, of, of sudden uh, peak experiences, uh, quantum leaps, uh, in fact, uh, and, and rebirth experiences, BPM4 uh, to use Stan's um, terminology. And um, the, uh, in fact, the very, the, the origin of peak experiences, which is, uh, of course, Abraham Maslow's term, uh, took place, uh, refers to two peak experiences or experiences that Maslow in his own life used as kind of paradigms of, of what he was theorizing about later. And these both took place under uh, the Jupiter uh, Uranus opposition of, of, of uh, 19, uh, 34, 35, and uh, in fact, we actually happen to be going through another one of those Jupiter-Uranus periods right now during this roughly 14-month period that we, we've entered into uh, this past fall, and we'll go through to the fall of, uh, of 2017. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, by contrast, um, it is Saturn transits, uh, transits to or from Saturn, particularly it, hard aspect by which we mean conjunction, opposition, or the 90 degree squares. Those uh, transits involving Saturn, particularly if they involve Saturn with uh, outer planets, other outer planets uh, uh, like Pluto or Neptune, even Uranus, can coincide with uh, much more challenging experiences they certainly can be very productive, fruitful, uh, transformative in the long run. But if I were timing a person's very first session, for example, I would be cautious about, um, I basically would tend towards um, uh, favoring uh, uh, dates and periods when um, there would be more um, what we call soft aspects, trines, sextiles, 120 degree and 60 degrees, uh, fewer of the hard aspect transits, um, more uh, with Uranus, Jupiter, uh, uh, and um, avoiding, particularly Saturn with Neptune uh, in hard aspect can be particularly uh, challenging for uh, psychedelic sessions for especially uh, early, um, kind of people who are first experimenting, I, I 
there have been many cases of, of uh, people who having had an experience like that, they, they have a sense that this is not something they want to do again, or they can have a lot of, uh, a lot more uh, psycho spiritually, metaphysically disorienting uh, kinds of experiences. That being said, for those who are more seasoned, uh, more experienced, uh, who have a better sense of the uh, fact that all deep um, psycho-spiritual transformation involves a much wider spectrum of um, positive and negative uh, experiences, can do very uh, deep and fruitful uh, work with um, Neptune-Saturn transits and, and any other uh, combination. Um, so I, I'm giving these, these very brief um, headlines, more by way of suggestions for people who are timing their, their sessions with, when you're wanting to maximize the likelihood of a, 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 a less challenging experience for a, a, a relative newcomer to, the, uh, to these fields. Um, Let's see if there's any other uh, anything else that I should should say in the in the remaining time that we have here. Um, I like the um, the it's it seems to me that um, you know Stan has often said that he sees the the future of psychology as being um, one that will integrate the a practice of using non-ordinary states of consciousness uh, as part of a, a, a therapeutic um, um, regime, combined with archetypal astrology, that these two together uh, seem to be the extraordinarily valuable and, and perhaps even essential for the deep kind of uh, psychological understanding and uh, transformations that we believe the future of psychology uh, uh, should be cultivating. And um, it's the more we have studied um, what we might call depth psychology, including transpersonal psychology, archetypal and Jungian psychology, psychoanalysis, all psychologies that have a depth dimension. Um, sense of the, the, the unconscious, the deep psyche. Um, the more we have studied uh, the relationship between depth psychology and what we might call a depth astrology, not the superficial predictive um, uh, kinds of astrology that are pretty widespread, not to mention the um, caricature that's in the newspapers of the sun, sun sign horoscope columns, but the deep, the depth astrology that is uh, doing is related to the kind of um, insights that we're talking about here. Uh, it's as if this, uh, there was a kind of deeper underlying um, unity, not just kinship, but a kind of unity uh, between the, uh, psychology and astrology, as if uh, one would almost say that it's, it's a, a marriage made in heaven. Um, for those of you who are interested with this very brief uh, introduction that, that Stan and I have just uh, laid out here, want to, um, to study more, uh, if you go to the website cosmosandpsyche.com, one word, cosmos and psyche, uh, and you go to the essays page, this is a website that, uh, that um, it's, it's my website, and on it, there's an essays page that you'll see a few essays there, one of which is called Introduction to Archetypal Astrology. Uh, it's about 18, 20 pages long. That could give you uh, a, a good grounding in uh, that, an introductory uh, grounding in the uh, material that we've been talking about here. And uh, on the resources page, I mean, there's nothing more valuable than getting uh, a really good reading of your birth chart. And on the resources page on that website, you can see a number of very fine astrologers who have uh, totally uh, assimilated Stan's work and my work, uh, Jung, uh, 
uh, James Hillman and archetypal psychology, et cetera. Uh, they've got a very good grasp of the material and they can give uh, excellent readings. So that's, a, that's a quite a good way to go. And then for a, a, a larger um, uh, overview, <clears throat> my book, Cosmos and Psyche, uh, uh, Intimations of a New World View, uh, it's a paperback. You can get it pretty inexpensively, I think about fifteen dollars uh, from Amazon. Uh, uh, it will will provide uh, a more um, adequate and uh, and uh, yeah a, a, a more uh, fully articulated rendering of what is ultimately uh, quite a mystery that uh, that's unfolded before our eyes here over, over the, the last 40 some years of, of research. So uh, with that, I thank uh, Stan, first of all, for uh, uh, inviting me to uh, be part of his uh, um, teleseminar series that he's doing with you. And um, it's been one of the great privileges of my life to, to, be, uh, to have learned as much as I have from Stan, to, to be his friend, to, and to have uh, work with him and talk for so many years together. Uh, and, and so, uh, and I look forward to many more. So uh, thank you. And uh, I'll say goodbye for both of us. In closing, uh, I would like to thank Rick very much for this uh, really important uh, contribution. Uh, I hope that you got at least a taste what uh, archetypal astrology can do and also about the importance of synchronicity that uh, really covers a very, very wild uh, range from uh, representing a major contribution to hard science, the quantum relativistic physics. And on the other hand, it can be used to explain uh, much uh, from esoteric systems, uh, things uh, like divination systems, uh, tarot, uh, parapsychological, phenomenon the way uh, Marie-Louise von France was, uh, was uh, writing about it in her book. And I would like to really emphasize uh, for you to uh, do some reading about synchronicity. It's an extremely important thing to, uh, to know when you are involved in some, some deep uh, self-exploration and many people got into trouble because they did not understand synchronicity and they went to the wrong people for, uh, for help. And uh, again, I would like to uh, second what Rick said about the importance to uh, get a personal reading, get the reading of transits if you do some significant work with holotropic states of consciousness. So thank you very much and uh, we'll see each other uh, next week. <laughs>